Okay, thanks Karsten. Um, so I'm very happy to uh, be back here to tell you a little bit about NMR of paramagnetic systems. So I don't think anyone in here would say or ever has said, oh, it's NMR, I can't, it's, it's paramagnetic, I can't take an NMR of that, I hope. If you have, I'll forgive you. But your organometallic colleagues might say that, right? So I'm hoping after you see my talk, you can s set them straight. That um, actually, if you uh, have a paramagnetic system, you should be extra excited to take an NMR spectrum of it because you can get so much more information out of that system. It, admittedly, if the characteristics are right. But um, NMR of paramagnetic systems is incredibly rich in information. So I'm going to walk you through um, some of the key concepts behind um, you know, why our NMR spectra of paramagnetic systems look like they do. So I'll just start out with some examples of some spectra. Um, and then we will look at nuclear versus electron spins and what their properties, um, how their properties influence their interaction that affects the NMR spectra. Um, and then we'll talk about relaxation and chemical shifts in paramagnetic systems. Okay, so I just have a collection of a few different spectra. These are all paramagnetic metalloproteins. So this happens to be uh, the cyanide derivative of cytochrome C, so it has cyanide histidine axial ligands. And you'll see that you have this big mess here in the middle, and that's all of the, the protein. And then you have a few beautiful, well-resolved peaks. All right, so these are hyperfine shifter resonances that go out past 20 ppm for the, the highest one. You also may notice, it's a little hard to tell, but these peaks are also broader than the peaks in the diamagnetic region. All right, so these are the two effects that you see in paramagnetic systems as you see uh, a, a wide chemical shift dispersion, a wide range of chemical shifts, and you also will see line broadening. It's the line broadening part that gives paramagnetic NMR a bad name sometimes, but we'll go into a little bit how to deal with that. Okay, so you might look at, look, now this system again is a cytochrome that's spin one half, and I'm gonna compare this to a, uh, this is a mutant cytochrome that turns out to be a mixture of spin one half, spin five halves. And so now you'll see that we still have these four intense resonances, so these turn out to be methyl groups on the heme periphery. But now they're shifted out, before it was around 20, now we're between 40 and 55 ppm, so we have larger shifts. And now it should be much more noticeable that the peaks are broader than, than you expect. So based on this, you might say, okay, um, if my system's higher spin, we'll have larger shifts and broader lines compared to low spin. Okay, so then let's look at this. So copper, of course, doesn't have high and low spin, but copper two is spin one half, just like the iron three. But now look at this. We have these really ugly broad peaks going out to 60 ppm, even though we're again spin one half. So clearly the system is behaving very differently from the spin one half iron system. And so then you might say, okay, copper is different. Copper spin one half is broader for some reason. But then I can throw this one at you. So this is a dinuclear copper site from the soluble fragment, the copper A fragment of uh, cytochrome C oxidase. So this state is um, copper one, copper two, mixed valent. And now we definitely have broad lines, but they're not nearly as broad as the, back here, the mononuclear copper site that we have in azurin. But it is still spin one half, all right? So copper spin one half can have different spectral properties as well. Um, so it's a little confusing, but all that means is that these are really rich uh, in information data. So these are all things that affect the appearance of your paramagnetic NMR spectra. And so these are all things that you can learn based on analysis of these spectra. So you can, uh, on the simplest levels, um, determine metal oxidation and spin state. You might be able to estimate the electron spin relaxation time. So this is that same transition that we learned about um, in the two talks about EPR, um, of the electron spin. Um, you can uh, deduce the amount of electron spin delocalization onto ligands or cofactors. Um, you can sometimes get hyperfine coupling constants from that information. You can um, uh, deduce whether there are second sphere effects or hydrogen bonds to ligands. You can determine the magnetic anisotropy, the magnetic axes of the system, and you can do a 3D structural refinement. Now you can't do all of these on all samples, but you can do at least one of these on pretty much any sample, and good samples you can do many of these. Okay, so in order to think about um, 
you know, why our spectra look like they do, we need to think a little bit more about the electron and nuclear spins because what we have going on here is we have our nuclear spin, and it's we're looking at that transition of the nuclear spin in NMR, but we're looking at how it's impacted by the electron spin. And uh, the EPR talks this morning really set us up very well for this, so um, I feel lucky to be able to follow those and kind of continue with the story here. So um, this should look familiar to you. Um, it's very similar to a slide that you saw from Art this morning. So this is now, though, the energy levels of a uh, um, spin one-half nucleus um, in a magnetic field. So when you apply a magnetic field to a spin one-half nucleus, this splits into minus one-half and plus one-half states. And when you do the NMR experiment, you are detecting this energy change here, which you can express based on the, um, the uh, uh, magnetic moment of the nucleus, the uh, applied magnetic field, and then the nuclear spin I. So the purpose of this talk, I'm going to just stick with spin one-half nuclei. Um, everything that I teach here, though, can be applied to higher spin nuclei, but it gets to be more complicated. But we're usually used to working with protons C13 and 15 that are all spin one-half conveniently. All right, so you will see that this is very similar to what you learned this morning about the electron spin transition, all right, where the energy of your electron spin in the presence of a magnetic field is given by this expression. Now, I'm using mu b rather than beta, but these are the same thing. These are the Bohr magneton. And the selection rule now is ms equals plus or minus 1, and so you get this transition between the plus and ms plus and minus 1 states. So, uh, looking at um, these spin transitions in nuclei and in electrons, and on the first glance, looks really similar to each other. Um, at least with protons, it's spin one half. They both have a magnetic moment that we can describe. Also, each has a gyromagnetic ratio, sometimes called a magnetogyric ratio, and those are the same things as each other. Um, so this is the, um, this ratio here. Now, we generally use the gyromagnetic ratio to describe uh, nuclear spins, and not typically for electron spins, but it also has that same parameter. Um, we can have an expression for the um, transition energy as a function of the applied magnetic field, and we have the selection rule for the transition. So they look really similar to each other. But there are two things that are different between nuclei and electron spins that um, are very important. So the first one of these is that electrons have a much larger magnetic moment compared to nuclei. So the proton is nearly the highest magnetic moment um, nucleus um, that we use. Actually, tritium is slightly higher, but we don't do a lot of tritium in MR. So um, proton has a very high magnetic moment, but it's still 658 times smaller than the magnetic moment of an electron. All right, so keeping in mind that it's interactions between these magnetic moments of these particles is going to be critical for determining chemical shifts and relaxation properties. Um, the fact that the magnetic moment of the electron is so high is going to mean that it's going to have some very large effects. Other differences, so um, the electron spin transition is a larger resonance frequency, so it's in the microarray regime, whereas with um, nuclei, like with protons, it's in the, uh, the radio frequency regime. And that's a direct uh, result of this higher magnetic moment uh, for the uh, proton, for the, uh, the electron. And another implication of this is that you have more efficient relaxation of electrons. So electron spin relaxation times um, range from roughly 10 to the minus 13 seconds to about 10 to the minus 8 seconds. So that's five orders of magnitude. Whereas nuclear um, uh, spin transitions are generally much slower, sometimes even seconds. So the second important difference between electrons and nuclei is that electrons are in orbitals. And nuclei, of course, are not. So nuclei have a defined position in the structure of the molecule, whereas electrons are, are delocalized, as we describe in our orbital model of them. And so that means that more than one nucleus will be able to sense an electron spin. And in fact, you can think of the electron you know, traveling through a molecule and visiting the different nuclei and perturbing their properties. Um, the other thing that is um, another consequence here is that you have spin orbit coupling um, for electrons. Um, I'm not going to have time to get more into the consequences of that, but that's just another um, factor to keep in mind. 
OK, so now let's look at the effect of unpaired electrons on relaxation. So relaxation is a very critical process in NMR spectroscopy, because that is when we're actually measuring our signal. All right, so in our NMR experiment, we have a pl an applied external magnetic field, B0. We have our sample in that magnetic field, and we get a net sample magnetization of our spins that we're probing uh, that we can put as a vector, call it MZ. We then will apply a pulse in the XY plane, so you'll, this should be very familiar from this morning, um, and we can tip that vector then down to if we apply it for, depending on how long you apply it, you will keep tipping it around like this, but if you apply it for just the right amount of time, you will tip that vector right down into the XY plane. And then you remove that radio frequency pulse, and this will then return to equilibrium. So this return to equilibrium we call relaxation, and we describe the characteristic time of that, or one over the rate constant, as either T1 or T2. All right, so, but again, as you also saw this morning, I don't have the cool uh, uh, animation, so I'll just have to imagine the cool animation. But um, you actually have, um, your spins are actually precessing at characteristic frequencies and different characteristic frequencies from each other, which is gonna give rise to chemical shifts. And so when we pulse this down into the XY plane, we're actually um, pulsing down this whole cone. And then, we, as this relaxes, that's when we measure our signal, all right? So what we do is we are observing the amount of um, signal here in the XY plane, and we will then record that as a function of time. And so if you're in the laboratory frame of reference, and this is precessing around and, and um, relaxing back up to the z-axis, you will get this nice, signal that I hope you've all seen an FID on NMR spectra, right? Sometimes they keep making them more and more like a black box so you don't get to see all these things in between. But um, you get this beautiful FID, so this is the frequency of the precession, but then also the intensity of the signal decreases over time. And so the time constant for that decrease of the signal is T2. <coughs> so that is the time it takes for your magnetization in the XY plane to go back um, to, to zero. T1 is another um, uh, time constant that we use to describe that relaxation, and that's actually the relaxation along the z-axis. So those two can be different from each other. You can have T2 much smaller than T1. Um, and in fact, in, in macromolecules, that's pretty common. Um, but in this talk today, I'm going to just take the assumption that T1 and T2 are equal to each other. With that assumption, you can still understand a lot of the phenomena, and that, that's just a good place to start. If anyone has questions about T1 and T2 differences, we can do that over drinks later. All right, so, um, oh, and I'll buy, because I'll be really excited if you actually want to know, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so then, you have your FID with this decay that is characteristic of your, your decay time, T2, and then you do your Fourier transform and take it from the time domain into the frequency domain, and then you get your peak. And your peak then occurs at a frequency that you can see here in the FID, and it also has a line width. And that line width is determined by the T2 with this um, equation. So your line width delta nu is just one over pi times T2. So this is really a nice direct observation of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle for energy and time. The shorter time you have to measure, the more uncertainty there is in the energy which is expressed here as a frequency. All right, so. There are many different relaxation mechanisms. Um, I'm going to talk primarily about dipole-dipole relaxation. Um, I also say a little bit about contact relaxation. Um, but this leaves out a lot of other mechanisms. But dipole-dipole relaxation is the most important um, and common uh, mechanism for the relaxation of uh, nuclei. So nuclear spins do not relax spontaneously. They have to exchange energy with other spins and or with the environment with, um, in order to return back to equilibrium. And so when we think about relaxation of protons then, that relaxation of every nucleus is gonna be impacted by all of the other nuclei around it as well as the unpaired electron. But if you have an unpaired electron around, remember it has this huge magnetic moment 658 times greater than the proton. So whatever this electron is gonna do is going to tend to dominate the properties of any uh, nuclei that interact with it. So, um, it turns out that we can describe the relaxation rate, so this is one over T1 or one over T2, so in the simplest case, these are equal to each other as I have them here. 
And this is determined by uh, a number of parameters that we can easily understand. So it's determined by the magnetogyric ratio of the nucleus. So for proton, this is going to be higher than for carbon-13, which is one quarter of proton, for example. Then we also have the G and the uh, Bohr magneton, and then um, the spin, and then also 1 over R to the sixth. So the, electron, the, prot the proton relaxation time depends upon its uh, distance from that electron um, with a very steep distance dependence. And then the other factor that I added here, which is very important, is tau s. That's the relaxation time for the electron spin. So in order for you to have this dipole-dipole um, interaction, you need to have the relaxation of the electron spin, which generates a fluctuating magnetic field that the proton spin can couple to, and that induces relaxation, and it can be very efficient. So if this tau s is long, so if it's in that world, long would be 10 to the minus 8th or 10 to the minus 9th, like copper 2 has, then your relaxation uh, rate is um, going to be fast, and you're going to have a short relaxation time for your nucleus, and that's going to translate to a broad line. Okay? So look, uh, if you have short tau s, and if your um, nucleus is close to your electron, you're going to get very broad lines. It turns out that of all these factors, obviously uh, distance is variable, but the one that is the most variable and the most important is the tau s, because it can vary over five orders of magnitude. So then it's helpful to know what tau s values are for some of the nuclei, that, for some of the, um, the metals that we, are, that we care about. All right, so for example, at the top, low spin iron 3, if it's 5 or 6 coordinate, you have really quite short electron relaxation time. And then, so if this value is small, the relaxation rate for the nucleus is small, and that means then your line broadening is relatively small. So um, you only get 0.5 to 20 hertz increase in, in the line width um, for a uh, proton five angstroms from that low spin um, iron 3. High spin iron 3, though, as you saw in the example I showed, slower electron relaxation, broader lines. If you go to uh, more extreme examples, manganese 2, manganese 2, very long electron relaxation time and incredibly broad lines. So the reason, just as an aside, um, the fact that manganese 2 relaxes so slowly and gives you such broad lines in NMR is directly related to its utility as a magnetic resonance imaging um, enhanced uh, contrast agent. So those nuclei that are good for MRI contrast, like mangan uh, manganese and gadolinium, are terrible for NMR because they are so good at inducing relaxation, they broaden your lines out incredibly. But what you'll see here on this chart is that there isn't really, you know, at least at first glance, a lot of rhyme or reason to, you know, why one system causes more line broadening than others, because this is not a simple periodic trend. It's not just a function um, of the spin or the oxidation state. It really depends on the electronic structure of that metal ion. And in particular, it depends upon whether you have low-line excited states. So if you have a metal ion that has low-line excited states, your electron spin then um, can relax efficiently because it can couple to those excited states. But if you do not have low-line excited states, like in manganese 2, then you have very inefficient electron relaxation. So um, this effect of uh, the unpaired electrons on nuclear relaxation um, has been now picked up more by the NMR community to be used as a tool. So people are actually now putting paramagnetic probes on their macromolecules and looking for line broadening in their, spec in their spectrum to see which nuclei then are close to that probe. And indeed, under the right conditions, your um, relaxation rate enhancement, which you can get from the line broadening, is going to be related to 1 over r to the 6. And so you can actually use this in order to get distance constraints from your paramagnetic probe and your nuclei. And this is now commonly used um, for uh, structure refinement and, or for maybe just um, determining if you have a really big, messy macromolecule, adding paramagnetic probes to it can start to give you a way to map out the structure by looking at which nuclei undergo line broadening. But there are some tricks to this. So in order for this uh, method to work, you need to be in a regime where dipolar relaxation dominates, which is not always the case. Um, and there are other effects on relaxation as well that can be significant. 
So if those other effects um, come into play, that can mess up your use of this. So this is a, a good tool to use, but there are times when people use it without remembering that it really has to be a pure dipole-dipole relax, uh, relaxation mechanism. Okay, so dipole-dipole relaxation is the most important mechanism. But contact relaxation also is important. And so as the name implies, this is a through-bond interaction between your unpaired electron and your nucleus. So this is the, in, the enhancement of nuclear relaxation that comes about from the delocalization of that electron spin to the nucleus itself. And this can occur just as a direct interaction through an orbital, or it can be as a result of a spin polarization effects. So um, your contact relaxation depends again on that tau s parameter, which is so variable, but also your hyperfine coupling constant squared and then the spin of the system. So um, it turns out that in macromolecules, the dipolar mechanism primarily dominates. Um, and that is just because it, when you are at distances that are small enough to get through bond interaction, the dipolar mechanism in those cases is very efficient for the macromolecules. For small molecules, it's a different story. For small molecules, you can have both of these mechanisms in play. And so interpreting line broadening in small molecules is more complicated than in macromolecules. So when you can have contact relaxation in play is anytime you have a very large hyperfine coupling constant, anytime that your tau s to tau r ratio is large, tau r is your tumbling time, your rotational correlation time for your molecule. And so um, I'm going to show an example, though, of contact relaxation in a protein, which is unusual, a little bit later. Okay, so usually people see the relaxation as annoying because of all the line broadening, but there is a lot that you can do, even if your lines are incredibly broad. Um, so you can try some cool tricks. All right, so I'll show you my favorite one. So this is um, from the Bertini lab, and what they did was they wanted to try to assign, determine the chemical shifts of the two beta protons on the cysteine um, in azurin, in copper 2 azurin. So copper 2 has a long electron spin relaxation time, so you get these really broad lines. And you don't see the H beta at all in the spectrum because they are broadened out so much. So they designed a very clever experiment in order to find those um, signals. What they did was they, um, sorry, they made a mixture of copper 1 and copper 2 azurin. So that's going to undergo self-exchange um, in your NMR tube. You can then identify that cysteine proton in the diamagnetic copper 1 spectrum. And then you can irradiate that. When you irradiate that, irradiate that, you saturate that particular signal. And then that saturation will transfer to the copper 2 species as it exchanges between the two. All right, so this is just a simple saturation transfer experiment. But what they did is they did it with this mixture of copper 1 and copper 2, where in copper 2 you can't actually see the peaks. But what they can do is you can take a different spectrum. And so when you saturate a signal, you decrease its intensity. When that saturation transfers to the other oxidation state, you'll get a decrease in the intensity of your spectrum for that copper 2 at particular points. So they did this at a whole bunch of different, um, whole bunch of different trials. And they got intensity changes in their copper 2 spectrum that look like this. So you'll notice, so this is uh, basically it's an NMR peak that stretches from 2200 ppm down to about zero. All right, so this is probably the broadest ever observed NMR peak, although it's not directly observed. So they were able to do this and determine actually the, the chemical shifts, the center of these, for the two different beta protons on the cysteine and determine they're at 800 and 850 ppm and they have line widths of 120,000 hertz. So that was a really cool trip. So now why do you care about this? So the chemical shift and the amount of line broadening tell you something about that um, coupling between the copper and the cysteine. And we're interested in that because um, bioinorganic chemists have known for a long time that you have a very strong coupling between the copper and the cysteine and you get unpaired electron spin delocalization onto the cysteine, which has impacts on reorganization energy and on electronic coupling in electron transfer. So the fact that these peaks have such large shifts and are relaxed so quickly is reflecting that effective electron spin delocalization.
So, and this is now the, the note that I'm going to make about contact relaxation. So as, as I said, in macromolecules like azurin, it's usually only dipolar relaxation that you see. But the dipolar relaxation mechanism on its own cannot account for this large line broadening that you get in the um, copper azurin. And so um, the remainder of that extra line broadening comes from uh, the um, contact relaxation, and that's because you have a, such a very large A value. OK, so um, the other thing you can do is you can take advantage of the situation. So if your nuclei are relaxing fast, um, it's going to be harder to saturate them. So this is the same uh, saturation phenomenon that you learned about this morning in EPR, that um, if you apply uh, too strong of a signal or apply it for too long, you can equalize your, um, your spin up and spin down populations and you lose your signal. But if your system's relaxing really fast, it will recover more quickly, and it's going to be harder to saturate it. So what you can do is you can pulse very quickly, collect more NMR um, transients in some period of time, and then what will happen is those peaks that have short relaxation times will be enhanced in that kind of a spectrum compared to all of the nuclei that have regular, longer relaxation times, which will be suppressed. So for example, in a protein, it's pretty common to have in a diamagnetic system uh, um, T1 of about 500 milliseconds for a typical proton. But protons that are really close to, say, a heme, which is this system, can have uh, relaxation times of just a couple milliseconds. So if you pulse, say, 10 or 20 or even more times per second, you're going to saturate all of those diamagnetic resonances, and you're going to emphasize the ones that have the short relaxation times. So um, this effect here is a little bit subtle, but um, I, I still like it. So this is a HSQC spectrum of an N15 labeled cytochrome C. And so in this spectrum, what we're doing is we are correlating um, N15 nuclei and proton nuclei. And so we typically get one peak for each NH bond in our protein. So this is a typical HSQC spectrum that you expect. But this is an iron-3 uh, paramagnetic protein. And so we, there were some peaks that were missing. And in particular, this protein has an axial histidine. And we did not see the NH on the axial histidine in the spectrum. But what we did is we um, modified the parameters in our experiment so that we have, um, this is expressed as 1 over a coupling constant. But basically, what we're doing here is we're pulsing faster. And when we do that, this little peak pops up here. And that's that axial histidine that's, be, that's relaxed quickly because it's so close to that iron. OK, another thing you can do, this is pretty simple. You can increase the temperature. So um, many of you are probably familiar with, um, uh, in NMR spectroscopy, your lines generally get broader as you go up in temperature. And that's generally because you are increasing your tumbling time of your molecule. And that actually makes relaxation less, um, less efficient and gives you narrower lines. That kind of a um, uh, phenomenon is greatly enhanced in paramagnetic systems. Because you're not only increasing the tumbling of the molecule, but you also are increasing the electron spin relaxation, uh, decreasing electron spin relaxation time. So this is one example here um, where you can have very broad paramagnetic peaks at low temperature and much more narrow when you go up to room temperature in a system like this. Now this one is cheating a little bit because there's also an exchange phenomenon going on in this one. Um, but this is still the kind of thing you often will see as you increase temperature. Those paramagnetic peaks will often just really sharpen up really nicely. OK, so the final thing you can do, if you're really having trouble with your sample, with collecting protons, let's say you're, you're working on a copper two sample, your, your peaks are really broad. Um, one thing you can do is switch nucleus. So instead of collecting proton data, you could work with carbon-13 and 15 or deuterium. Because the relaxation enhancement through the dipole-dipole mechanism depends upon gamma squared. And um, uh, N15 and C13 have lower gamma, lower magnetogyric ratio. And so they experience significantly less line broadening uh, than protons. So this is another um, really cool example from the Bertini lab, where they were working here. This is with a heme protein that had really very fast uh, um, re relaxation and really broad lines so that they couldn't get proton data. But what they did is they invented a new type of experiment where you uh, N15 and C13, you la label your, your protein. And then you 
uh, do a carbon-13 N15 correlation spectrum, and you're detecting carbon-13 directly and detecting N15 indirectly. And in this experiment, um, then you're able to get peaks for many of your, um, your residues in your protein. And so your line width is going to be 1 16th of what it would be if you were collecting with protons. So that's that gamma squared uh, parameter. So that can be your friend. So as you work with lower gamma nuclei, the sensitivity goes down, but in a paramagnetic system, the line widths go way down. And 15, even better, a hundredfold factor. Okay, so just to summarize what we've looked at with relaxation. Um, first, the metal site has a huge effect on the appearance of your spectra. And tau s, that electronic relaxation time, is the key parameter to be aware of. And so looking up that value will give you a good idea of what to expect in your system. Um, there are a number of systems also that show minimal line broadening, so you can do, use a lot of the standard NMR um, methods on them. So low spin iron 3, my favorite, that's really nicely behaved. Um, four coordinate high spin nickel 2. Five and six coordinate high spin cobalt 2, that's also really beautiful. And six coordinate high spin um, iron 2 is pretty good. Um, most of the lanthanides, um, gadolinium definitely excluded, but most of, the, most of the trivalent lanthanides also give you really beautiful hyperfine shifted peaks with minimal line broadening. So another thing to remember, this gamma squared factor you can use to your advantage. And then you can also use relaxation enhancement in order to, as a probe of your structure. Okay, so I'm going to end with talking about chemical shifts, which is... I think the funnest part. All right, so you get this huge range of hyperfine shifts when you take your NMR spectrum of a paramagnetic protein or other mo molecule. And that's usually the thing that's most striking to us when we look at these spectra. Um, interpreting them is not so easy. So they can be higher or lower than di the diamagnetic region. So you can have a shift of plus 800 or minus 400. Um, there's two mechanisms that cause those shifts, contact and dipolar, and those are in effect in general for many nuclei. So you have to consider both of those phenomena. Um, unlike with relax, oh, that's what I just said, um, they contain, and then those, those shifts though contain information on electronic structure, specifically spin delocalization onto ligands or a cofactor, and also the magnetic anisotropy of the system can be deduced from analysis of the shifts. Okay, so here's back to my favorite cytochrome C spectrum, and you see these nice shifted peaks out here, and you see this little one out here as well that's also hyperfine shifted. So the shifts that you observe in your spectrum are just a sum of the shift that you would have in a diamagnetic system added to the paramagnetic effects, which then we're going to break down to contact and pseudocontact. So I'm going to call these pseudocontact shifts rather than dipolar. You can substitute dipolar in your head if you like, um, but it's, this is for technical reasons, so that'll be a second drink, um, I, we use pseudocontact. All right, um, so the diamagnetic shift is the shift in an isostructural diamagnetic molecule. So nowadays, if you have a three-dimensional structure of your protein, you can just put it into some programs that will spit all of the predicted diamagnetic shifts back out at you. And you can use that as your diamagnetic reference, or you can measure them yourself. So then we have contact and pseudocontact, through bond and through space interactions. All right, so the contact shift depends on these factors here. So it's not too bad. So the hyperfine coupling constant, um, the spin, um, and then 1 over temperature. So note that as the hyperfine coupling constant gets larger, your contact shift gets larger. So your contact shifts are proportional to your hyperfine coupling constant. So they're a really nice probe of that important parameter. Spin, again, is important. 1 over temperature is important. So this is the Curie law. And then, um, one thing I will note is it looks like they might be dependent upon your nuclear magnetogyric ratio, but they are not because this cancels with part of the hyperfine coupling constant. So the cool thing about contact shifts is they're actually independent of the nucleus that you're working with because of that cancellation there. So the contact shift, because it is, uh, as you see from this hyperfine coupling constant dependence, it reflects the, the spin density at the nucleus. Um, the sign reflects positive or negative spin density, all right? So you can get both that, that, um, the sign as well as the magnitude. For nuclei one to three bonds from a paramagnetic metal, usually the contact shift is dominant. 
Um, however, if you have a, uh, a conjugated system like a, like a heme or some other system where you can um, spread that unpaired electron spin density out over a wider area, you can still see contact shift over many more bonds than that. This um, inverse temperature dependence is really helpful for identifying these peaks. And again, it can be used to estimate your hyperfine coupling constant. Okay, so for example, again, going to the cyanide derivative of the cytochrome C mutant, there are these four uh, intense peaks with uh, have large shifts. These are these four methyl groups on the heme. And you have a large amount of spin density delocalized from the iron way out there to the heme periphery because of that aromatic system. We can specifically uh, assign these using different methods to those particular methyl groups on the heme. And you'll see then that eight here has the largest amount of spin density, and three has the smallest amount of spin density. That pattern of delocalization in hemes is determined by your angles of your axial ligands, and especially the pi bonding. So you can take that pattern, and from that you can predict what your, your ligand angles look like in your system. So another um, example of a contact shift application that I really like is this is a case where then in an NMR study of this cyanide derivative, we found this one exchangeable peak way out at 20 ppm. And so this peak goes away in D2O. So we finally assigned it to a tyrosine OH, where that hydrogen then has to be hydrogen bonded to the cyanide because the um, shift that we get for that peak is too large to be accounted for by through space effects only. It has to be some through bond interaction. So that tells you that there is a hydrogen bond between that hydrogen and, and the cyanide group. So that's an example of how you can use contact shifts in order to do something about um, your, um, your second sphere interactions. So another example here, going back to Azurin, where I showed the trick for the Bertini group used um, to determine these large hyperfine shifts of the cysteine beta protons. And those then they could convert into um, hyperfine coupling constants and determine that there was about 2% unpaired spin density detected through this method. Now, uh, one little caveat is that NMR is sensitive only to spin density that's in S orbitals and S-like orbitals that bring electron spin density very close to the nucleus. And so sometimes you'll have deviations from other methods because of that. But it's still a nice method to look at these patterns. Okay, so the pseudocontact shift then, we will switch to now. So this is a through space electron nucleus interaction. So the pseudocontact shift depends upon uh, these factors here. And again, this equation should look pretty familiar to you. So 1 over r cubed, and then the axial and rhombic anisotropies of the system. And then also these other factors here, this geometric factor. So in particular, your, um, dependence, your, your shift depends upon the magnetic anisotropy of the system, and then the location of that nucleus that you're probing relative to those magnetic axes. <coughs> So if, for example, you have a perfectly axial system, so delta uh, rhombic is zero, and we're, I'm putting in a typical value for axial anisotropy, and if we have a proton at five angstroms, we can calculate what our um, pseudocontact shift for that proton would be at different angles. All right, so here's my z-axis. So if I have a proton five angstrom from uh, that metal, and it's at 54.7 degrees exactly, you will have no pseudocontact shift at that magic angle. So there's a strong angular dependence. But then if you have a proton that's out here at 90 degrees, minus 6.4 ppm, and then down here at 180 degrees, it's going to be plus 12.7 ppm. So you have this, a distance and an angular dependence, all dependent also on the anisotropy and the orientations of those magnetic axes. So these are some other examples of uh, uh, isopseudocontact shift surfaces. So uh, this is the same shape that I showed you on the previous slide. Basically, it's a dz square orbital shape. But if you have non-zero rhombicity, then you smush the middle donut here somewhat, and you have a little more, bit more complex isopseudocontact shift um, surface. So those of you taking the paramagnetic NMR tutorial will get to determine and play with isopseudocontact shift sur surfaces in some different heme proteins that have different uh, magnetic axes from each other. All right, so the pseudocontact shift then, because it depends upon the, the magnetic and isotropy of the system, uh, will its uh, amount of pseudocontact shift you get will change greatly with the different 
uh, metal that you have. So if you're using something like terbium-3 and some of the other um, trivalent lanthanides, these have huge anisotropies. And so you get very, very large pseudocontact shifts in these systems. So this is why these are really popular probes um, that are introduced in order to get structural information. Um, other systems, though, have very small anisotropy. So for example, um, copper-2 and gadolinium-3 um, are really kind of a nightmare because they have very little anisotropy to give you much of a pseudocontact shift, but they also give you, have really um, slow electron relaxation and fast nuclear relaxation. So you can then um, determine your magnetic axes of your system um, by measuring and analyzing pseudocontact shifts. So once you determine your pseudocontact shifts from your, your system, which you can do by measuring your observed shifts and then subtracting the diamagnetic component, you can then fit all of those data to this equation where you vary the axial and rhombic anisotropies and um, the locations of your nuclei that you're analyzing. And if you simultaneously solve a whole bunch of equations for that, you can then determine the anisotropies and the orientation of magnetic axes. So since you have this strong structural dependence of your pseudocontact shifts, then it also will follow that you can use the pseudocontact shifts to refine uh, a structure. So you could start with uh, a known structure that's maybe poor resolution. You could then add a paramagnetic probe to it or you know, put the, uh, the existing center into a oxidation state that is paramagnetic. And then what you can do is start with your original coordinates, and what you, I won't talk through this whole procedure, but basically it's an iterative procedure where you will enter the pseudocontact shifts, calculate them for a certain orientation and anisotropy, compare them to each other, and then if they're close enough to the same, you're done. If not, you start over again. And you keep doing an iterative um, refinement here until you converge. And then in this case, you can have a much higher resolution solution structure um, of your system compared to what you would have if you did not have a paramagnetic probe. So this um, method is now actually pretty standard in NMR um, packages for, for solution structure determination, where people will often add paramagnetic ions to their system in order to induce this effect and use it in order to add more restraints to, for their structure. Okay, so um, to wrap up, um, as I said, you all know for sure, I hope, you can take NMR spectra of paramagnetic molecules. Um, there's a, a huge amount of information in these spectra. What kind of information you get can depend a lot on the electronic structure of the system, though. Um, electron spin relaxation time, that tau s, is what's key in determining how much line broadening you will get. And then also that magnetic anisotropy dependence of the pseudocontact shifts is really important and valuable to keep in mind if you want to use a system like that in order to do a refinement. Okay, so I want to end by thanking my, my past and current students who have contributed to my group's work in NMR. And also I want to thank my mentors. Um, Harry let me go and work with Ivano for some time as part of my PhD. And um, so of course Ivano, who we miss very much, and Lucia, Paula, and Claudio in their lab, and then my postdoc advisor, Gerd Lamar. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank all of you for listening today. I don't know if we have time for questions. Are there any, are there any questions? Um, I think the time scales are not, that's a good point, I mean with the faster relaxation in theory you could see faster processes, but NMR is a technique that you generally apply at equilibrium. Um, so I don't think there would be a way to catch that. The sensitivity of the method is too low to kind of do a transient sort of experiment. But maybe someday, that, that would be cool. <laughs> Questions?